the three texts for this evening. The main text for the message tonight is Isaiah 52. But preceding that, we want to read a couple of New Testament verses that give us the insight to what's going on in those passages. First, First Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. In Isaiah chapter 52, Reading at verse, thir- starting at verse 13 of Isaiah 52, reading through Isaiah 53. This is the famous text, probably the most famous text of the Old Testament. It's as if Isaiah in prophetic vision is before the very cross of Christ himself as he points us into the future of the coming of our Savior. 700 years before Jesus even appeared. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him, No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered 
that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out a soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Let us pray. Holy Father, we do pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us as we consider the meaning of this text and why it is that this one suffered so. Illumine our minds, warm our hearts, bind us afresh, we pray, to Christ crucified. We pray in his name. Amen. As we consider this particular text in the book of Isaiah, the question is, is what is the larger context in which it exists? You got a little bit of a flavor of it in the call to worship from chapter 40 of Isaiah. The people were in exile. The people had the curse laying upon them. They had been driven away out from the promised land, driven east under the Babylonian captivity of God's judgment. They were far from God, far from His dwelling place, far and away from being near to the God with whom they had covenant. But why? Why is it that God's own people that he had chosen, God's own people that he brought into special relationship on Mount Sinai in a covenant that bound them to him and he to them, why? Why had they fallen under the weight of that curse and were driven away from his favorable fellowship or no longer near to him? And the answer to that is they broke covenant with God. They had violated his law. They had sins of commission, sins of omission with regard to those Ten Commandments. The first four commandments had instructed them, here's how you love God. You shall have no other God before you and on. They had not loved him. They had strayed from him. They had sought out other gods that they were hoping would satisfy and tickle their fancy and pay off and at a greater price than the God that had made promises to them. The other prophet Jeremiah said, You have forsaken him who is the fountain of living water, and you've gone to empty and dry cisterns. No longer. Were they prizing Him as their God? No longer were they praying to Him and praising Him. They had wandered astray. And rather than enjoying the blessings of obedience, now they must suffer the curse, the ultimate curse of being driven out of that promised land, driven into exile. Not only had they not loved God, they had not loved each other. They had not cared for one another as the commandments had called them, as love had called them to care. 
whether they are filled with conflict, open hostility and secret resentment drew them apart from each other. What a ragtag society that they had such a great prospect of becoming that they had become, and thus away they had driven. There was a great separation, Isaiah 59, chapter or chapter 59, verse 2 says, there's a separation between you and your God. There's a distance between you. There's a wall up between you because your sins, your iniquities have separated you from Him. And so loaded up with guilt in their conscience, even though they were hard-hearted about it all, they were driven into exile. They carried the weight of their sin away from the Lord. But how could they be recovered? Can they be recovered? Is there some kind of recovery to be made for sinners who have not loved God as they ought and not loved their fellow man as they ought? Is there, is there hope for recovery? And right here, in this glorious text of Isaiah 52 and 53, we are presented with this suffering servant. He is the one who would deal with the sins of his people. And we should not miss that what Isaiah presents to us here. That the suffering servant has taken upon himself the transgressions of his people. The judgment due them had fallen upon him. Here we see in Isaiah, as well as the Old Testament itself, as well as the New Testament, as it speaks to us of Christ, the fulfillment of this suffering servant, a penal substitutionary atonement. In theological circles and in biblical studies, more and more theologians and Students of the Word are seeking to suppress, if not altogether avoid, penal, substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. But this is exactly what Isaiah is saying here. He was pierced for our transgressions, not his, ours. And he was the one pierced. Hebrew, that's language of warfare and being attacked with a weapon, pierced. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and with his wounds we are healed. Isaiah goes on to say, It's we are like sheep, we've gone astray. Every one of us. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Penal, substitutionary atonement. He is a man of sorrows because he, though innocent, though righteous, was loaded up with the guilt of our sins. And not only the guilt, but the judgment to follow as he bore the sentence of death upon that cross. This is what Isaiah presents to us as the way out of exile. The only way back to God is through him who would bear our sins in our behalf. And yet just simply knowing this, simply being informed of this, simply becoming conscious of it, simply being able to say, oh, Jesus died for sinners, is not enough. No, it's necessary to know these things. But we must respond to them. That's the vital difference between just hearing and actually responding. So we must return. We must return to the Lord, as Isaiah says in the in chapter 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And he is near in the hearing of what the suffering servant has done that we might be returned to him. 
Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Yes, just like the prodigal son was far from his father's estate, wasting his substance, sinking lower and lower until he finally knows, I've, I've got to do something about this. <laughs> Said his senses returned to him. But what did he do? He didn't say, well, I guess I've been wrong all along. I guess, guess Dad was right. No, he got up, and what did he do? He returned to his father. To say to his father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. He needed to repent. He needed to face those sins that had caused such a distance between him and the father. And he needed to return. That's the language of Scripture to response to what the suffering servant has done. No, we can't bear the guilt or the judgment of those sins. But we can repent of them by the grace of God. We must repent of them. We must return and come back home to Him. And so we have today this Good Friday, this sacred Friday, this serious and sober Friday to give special attention to what can possibly restore us to God. To be able to answer the question, why am I so distant? Why am I so dull? Why am I depressed? Good Friday. It's a good time to do that spiritual checkup. I think many of us here have an annual physical checkup with the doctor. And you might say Good Friday is a good time to have that intensive annual spiritual checkup. You may have had some symptoms showing up during the year. Well, it's time to stop and maybe take a biopsy, see what's behind, look a little deeper as to what might be going astray and why the sense of distance why the sense of dullness why am i not as responsive and animated by the things of the lord that i used to be we all like sheep have gone astray but thank god for our lord jesus christ that though we may have gone astray he has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. There is a solution to our profound problem. There is a way of restoration for our alienation. We who are far can draw near. And as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, that he says he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He said he did so that we might return under the shepherd of our souls. And Paul speaks in similar fashion in Ephesians chapter 2 as he brings us to the cross, the cross of Christ. That's how God brings us back to Him. That's how He joins us together with Him. We who are far, we are brought near through the preaching of the cross. It's proclamation. If we will but respond, and respond we must. If we are to derive the benefits of that cross, of having access to our Father in heaven, and being close to Him, and not only restored to the love of God, but Paul points out that that same cross has a power that unites us to each other. The walls between each other are melted that we might be rejoined because of the cross and the love of God and the power of redemption there, not only vertically, but horizontally. The cross. The cross 
where we learn of Christ crucified, where we learn of Isaiah's suffering servant, is not only to be preached, but it is to produce an effect. It has a distinct purpose. And that distinct purpose is to produce in us repentance and to return to Him. Return to communion with God, fellowship with God, nearness of God. To know that He is near and I am near Him. The cross is through which the movement can be realized from distant to near. Come, let us reason together, Isaiah says. Oh, your sins be as scarlet, be as white as snow. They're, they're red like crimson. They will be like wool. Isaiah 1.8 realized in the precious cross of Jesus Christ Yes, the cross can make the most defiled clean. The cross can make the one who is the, the furthest conceivably away from God in his opposition to Him or his drift away because of lack of attention. The cross hearkens us back. The cross assures us that though we be far, we can draw near to Him. Though God, it seems, may have forsaken us altogether, we can receive His promise in the cross because of Christ who was forsaken, that I will never leave you or forsake you. Oh, how the cross should stir our hearts to know the love of God in Jesus Christ and not to let it lay follow, but to respond to it in heartfelt love, heartfelt repentance, and above all, heartfelt 